Of all the achievements in the climbing world, none are more coveted than the first ascent. From the old days of Yosemite hardmen trying to one-up each other with dangerous aid climbs to more modern forms of grade chasing, top athletes in the sport have always had a fascination with pushing the limits of what was considered possible. The feat has now been split into multiple categories. First 9A flash, first 514 off with, hardest big wall climb, hardest descent by a female. But the most sought after achievement has always been establishing a new grade. Over the past few decades, only a select few climbers have had the honor of doing so, and the list reads like a lexicon of all-time greats. Jerry Moffitt, Wolfgang Gulich, Alex Huber, Chris Sharma, and Adam Andra. Somewhere in that list though, there's a blemish. A 65-foot overhung roof in Villeneuve, France, full of mono pockets, dynamic moves, and glued holds. This is the place where Fred Ruling once spent three months of his life projecting a route that would spawn one of the most controversial periods in climbing history and would make him one of the sport's most infamous figures. This is the story of Akira. The 80s and 90s were a transformative time for rock climbing. With the invention of modern training methods and the widespread acceptance of red pointing, grades were beginning to be pushed to new and impossible heights. Leading the charge were a slew of historically powerful European climbers. The Huber brothers, Wolfgang, Ben Moon, Jerry Moffat. These guys were real life superheroes at the absolute peak of their game and right around 1995, they started to focus on a common goal, establish the grade of 9A. This was seen to be a landmark achievement that had yet to be done. Ironically, a few climbs of this grade had actually already been ascended, namely Action Direct and La Rambla, but they had yet to be upgraded and were still thought to be 8C pluses. Because of that, this new, futuristic generation of climbers were on a mission. Use their campus boards and steel fingers and raw strength to find a new level within the sport and break into an entire new number grade. And then on June 6, 1995, the news broke that an unknown climber at an unknown crag had put up a new route and assigned it the grade of 9B. That climber was Fred Ruling, and that route was Akira. That was two or three grades above what had been established at the time. That would be like if the news broke tomorrow that Matty Hong or Jonathan Segrist had established a route and graded it 516B. It was absolutely ludicrous, and the climbing community responded by attacking not only the route, but also the ascensionist. Within a matter of months, Fred Ruling had gone from a relatively unknown climber to the face of everything that was seen to be wrong with the sport at the time. Overgrading, commercialization, and dirty ethics. The rumors started flying. Fred Ruling chipped holds and glued his route so they could never be repeated. Fred Ruling was 6'6 and relied only on his 1.3 ape index to reach moves that no one else could do. Fred Ruling got shut down on the opening sequence of Biography and couldn't even climb a V7. Wrote all of this and for nearly a decade after the news about Akira came out, no one thought to ask Ruling about his side of the story and for some reason, despite the claims by some of the top climbers in the world that there was not the slightest chance that Akira was as hard as Ruling said it would be, none of them ventured out to France to try it. Today, I want to talk about the story of Akira, the lost magnum opus of rock climbing. I want to examine how what should have been one of the sport's landmark achievements has instead become a footnote in its history and a potential blemish that has yet to be resolved. Most importantly though, I want to answer the lingering question two and a half decades later, is it really a 9B? Let's rewind a little bit. Instead of focusing on the climbing world and their reaction, let's zoom in and take a closer look at the man behind the controversy, Fred Rowling. Very little is known about him and most of what I'm going to say here is taken from a 2004 article written by Pete Ward. Pete describes Fred as easygoing, unassuming, and completely obsessed with the beauty, poetry, and purity of rock climbing. He's a lifelong professional climber, although he never really made it as a professional, in part due to the controversy, and he probably never reached his full potential. 
A chunk of his prime he had to miss due to his wife having brain surgery, which required him to stay home with the kids. Whenever he had time though, ruling would climb. He cut his teeth at his local crag, Leo Claire, and it's on these bulging limestone cliffs that ruling started to develop his signature style of dynamic moves and minimal footwork. It's a method that I'm very familiar with, and if I could send anything harder than a V6, you might say that we have similar styles. He went to college in the south of France, where he was exposed to some of the most cutting edge routes in the world. He established two 8C routes there, at the time when that grade was still in its infancy. It wasn't until Ruling came back to his hometown, though, that he really started to push the limits of what was possible. His first big climb was Hugh, a 60-foot double overhung pump fest that he graded 9A, making it one of the most difficult climbs in the world at this time. Now, I think it's important to stop here and talk about some of Ruling's ethical concerns. He freely admits to modifying routes, filling up holes when a section is too easy, drilling or chipping holes when a section is too hard. Nowadays, these practices seem shady at best, but there are a couple things that I think are important to consider. The first is that the 1990s were simply a different time and ethics were a lot fuzzier back then. Chipping and filling of holds was commonplace and even the best like Wolfgang Gulich are alleged to have done it, although I personally can't confirm this. What ruling did may not have been right, but it was a product of the time. The other thing to think about is Ruling's personal circumstances. He was an incredibly gifted climber who tore through all of the hardest routes at the crags he visited, and he was obsessed with pushing the limits. However, he also had a wife and kids back home, and he didn't always have the resources to do it. He wasn't Adam Andra or Chris Sharma, who were free to travel the world on sponsored trips, bolting tens of lines until they find the one that's just perfectly balanced between possible and impossible. He was limited to work with the cliffs he had, and so he made do. When he first climbed Hugh, he decided it was too easy. He filled in some holds and damaged some other ones, and then started the working project again now that it was more challenging. Obviously, everyone will have their own ethical beliefs, but I find it hard to fault him for doing something that simply allowed him to push his own limits on his hometown Craig. After Hugh, Ruling was ready for something more and this is when he discovered Akira. It's a 65 foot near horizontal roof, tucked away less than a kilometer away from his house, and while Fred clearly filled some holds, he claims that none of them are manufactured. Around the time that he discovered the route, Ruling's wife took a fall while free soloing and broke her back. She had to stay home for months on end and it fell on Ruling to care for her. During this period, he describes Akira as an escape, the route allowed him to take his mind off the constant stress of his wife's injury and just focus on the beauty of the climb. When Celine, his wife, recovered sufficiently, she started coming with him to Belay and it was her who helped him tie in for the final section of the route when he finally sent it. Now, obviously I've never met him, but based on what I've read, it's really hard to imagine that Ruling did Akira as an attention grab. His intentions at the time seem to be pure and he seems to truly believe in the difficulty of the route. So that brings us to the next question. Is it really a 9B? This is a question that I'm actually going to dive into next week and I'm sorry for the cliffhanger guys but I also am a law student with exams coming up and I don't have time to edit a 15 minute video every week so I have to break this one up into two parts. Let me know in the comments what you guys thought of the video. I know it's a bit different than what I normally do, but I had a lot of fun writing it and I really hope you enjoyed watching it. Tomorrow we're gonna look at Akira. I'll break down some of Fred's climbing, his technique and his style, and we'll try to establish if this route is actually anywhere close to being in the 515 range. Thank you as always for watching and stay tuned for part two next week. I will see you guys next time.